schedule, we're closing in on some final versions of some possible votes on bills. The first of which is uh, S12, the State Energy Management Program. Ms. Wasserman, if you could just join us at the table. I think we asked for some amendments last time. Or are I we think all? We voted out the amendment yesterday. Mm -hmm. We did. Sorry. Yeah, that was, yeah, that we got pr productive ahead of time, and um, this was <coughs> sorry. Now I remember. If we had one more uh, hiccup or anything, I wanted to make sure we had a chance to make uh, a last-minute edit. So I think um, we are actually entirely set. Unless anyone's had some uh, come up with an issue overnight that I'm unaware of. So do we have that um, vote sheet for that? Yeah. Yes, we do have a vote sheet for yesterday. You want to see it? No, you, no, no. You, do you not remember? Uh, you want to see the vote sheet? <laughs> no, I want to, I want to check the vote carefully first. All right, thank you very much. Okay, great. This is me saying like all done. This, this nice work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easiest part of my morning. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're on a roll now. Yeah. Yeah. You're, like, you're in the wrong committee. They great clothes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell it. You can just work on it. The other, the next, uh, I, honestly, I did forget that we, we went ahead and had that vote. This was a fail safe uh, spot on the schedule in case there was something more to do. So on S30, uh, we were looking at the draft. Uh, but sure, do you want to have a final vote on that or no? We just we just amended the bill yesterday. I'm sorry. No, I, I just want to make sure that. Yeah, no, I wanted to go ahead and vote it. I okay. don't know why I we wanted to two steps. Were we waiting for a clean copy back? No, she said there were no changes. Well, so we, to the amendment, we okay. We can take a minute. All right. So we you pull out the vote sheet and we'll finalize it by moving with the bill as amended, please. We do it all at once. That's what. Yeah, I'm trying to think why that. So this is the final vote. Uh, okay. Well, so I'm gonna the the uh, just for belt and suspenders here. Uh, the what I've recorded is a vote of two to one. We had people out of the room. No, we had three to zero zero. So you had what? Well, I don't know. Three zero zero. You're the clerk. So what do you think? No, I'm sorry. There were three, three, three people here. Three zero two. Okay. You'll get it. I'll get it. Right. The draft, the, the amendment we made, just to get clarity, was draft one point one, timestamp five thirty nine p.m. <laughs> so that's the one that you have. The amendment. That's the amendment you have. Our that's, that's um, the amendment that we have to vote yeah. So, having so amended the bill, then I'd be looking oh, for a motion to vote the bill as so amended. So moved. Okay. And, put call the roll, please. Uh, Senator McDonald. Yes. Senator Parent. Yes. Senator Rogers. Yes. Senator Campion. Yes. Senator Bray. Yes. <coughs> bill. Is there anyone who would like to report this bill? I move folding chairs in <coughs> town halls, but not, not legislation. I'm happy to report the bill. Okay. Thank you very much. So S12 is uh, squared away. Trans Harding wants to say. I didn't feel the smoke there. I'm just but putting it away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just pushing the version I hear. With I didn't feel this well, well, I'm just pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> and we know where most wheelbarrows that are being pushed are, what they're full of and where they're okay. going. Thank you. Thanks to court. Senator Gray is going to be correct. 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 That was, a major, that was a major lift. We maybe should take a break now. <laughs> um, you have a chance to do more lifting. S30. Um, so we had, uh, we went through the draft. We took testimony there. 
the Deputy Secretary filled this in on uh, the Clean Water, I'm sorry, the Clean, the clean Alliance's effort to come up with a, uh, another standard. And uh, so I had asked uh, Mr. Watt if he could bring us language that, uh, recommend language to us as we looked at moving S30 forward. Did we want to make modifications to allow for the state to participate in this clean alliance effort that was going to be a shared standard by I think, 23 states, something like that. Um, and do you, did you bring copies of the language? I did not. I haven't had a chance to be in the office before. OK. Um, and it's, so Last night, I saw. Is that the one you sent me though? That was like kind of you couldn't read it because it was. It's readable. It's just not in in pretty bill format. So while we're getting copies of the readable but not pretty bill format version of the suggested edits, it doesn't matter what they look like. We can still look at the problem. Um, Do you want to join us at the sure. table? And uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, uh, joined by Colin Smythe from the Department of Environmental Conservation, who is one of the people working with the U.S. Climate Alliance uh, on working on language that uh, all states can use to develop regulations associated with phase down or phase out of HMCs. So uh, Colin is the technical expert. If, has, if you have any questions, he maybe he'll answer them. Uh, while we're waiting on language, the idea was this, the, the idea with our edits. I'm sorry, but I want to make sure that you have it. This way, you can get copies of it. So the, the purpose of our edits were to align with, um, with the work that is ongoing uh, with at the multi-state level and to make sure that we don't create definitions that are in conflict uh, either with federal statutes or with or the work that's ongoing so that when we come back to you through the LCAR process, there's no inconsistencies between the, the other piece. In broad strokes, uh, what we've asked you to, to ask us or direct us to do is to promulgate rules by, I believe it's by July 1st, 2020 and report back to you by January 15th of next year on the, the status of those rules as we talked about uh, and, and to say where we are in any, un, any unforeseen issues that might slow that process down. Senator Bray, as you and I have discussed, having essentially a report back to say where, where is it, how are you doing. Uh, the, we believe that we can likely do it prior to the, that July 1, 2020 date. However, because we're in this multi-state process and it's worth getting the entire market moved, we want to make sure that that has time to play itself out. Okay. Um, and it's the, the target goals for the program through the alliance, how do they compare to what the underlying bill was? The, we don't change the that part I believe that's built on the Kigali Amendment uh, language that's anyway. That's right. Yeah. So we, we didn't make change to the to the goal of the I believe it's the reduction of 30 40 percent by 20, 2030. Yeah, that that we don't change. Right. So in essence, the changes we conform to federal definitions. We keep on working with other states. You do it through a rulemaking, and then you report out next January as to whether or not. For where we are, either we have well told you that the rules are already in, you know been filed, or we will tell you where we are in that process. Okay. Um, and if for some reason the multi-state effort were to break down, we would tell you how we're moving forward on the individual state level. Let me ask you a question. So when you say the rules have been filed, where? So we're, Can you just we're, give me we're the, sense? the goal is to have finalized the rules by the, the what's in statute is to have. Uh, filed with the with the Secretary of State by July 1st, 
July 1, 2020. So those are final rules. Okay, so they haven't been filed yet. Right. Okay. They, yeah, they, they haven't been filed yet. They haven't been filed okay. in any... That's what I was wondering. When there's a doing. draft in California that a lot of the work is being, is based on, Yeah. but it, that hasn't been filed yet as a final rule either. Okay. And they are part of that discussion, so... Um, and can you remind me again, was it uh, the alliances, uh, did you say 23 states or something? It is like now that? 23 states. Okay. And over 50% of the population and over 50% of the GDP of the U.S. And from bipartisan states around the country. So the launch of defense is enough to create greater inertia. Inertia can work both ways. We're creating continued movement. I suppose inertia went an object's in motion, it's momentum. I, we can have a three. physics discussion. It's <laughs> one, two, three. Pretty good at that in high school. Don, Don looks ready. Yeah, I'm very excited about it too. Um, some specific. We'll we'll wait for the language and we'll go through some specifics. Um, and some of these I might not entirely be able to answer because our because uh, Megan O'Toole, the the air quality attorney for for DC, did did some of this work and I. I think she was doing some based on consistency, but I will uh, speak to them as best I can. She would hope to be here today, but was unable to. And so if we have follow-up questions, we'll go back to Megan okay. with them. Well, yeah, so I think in terms of voting, we just, we have to vote tomorrow. Yes. So, um, but I, I don't think our, our edits are particularly controversial. Right. Um, and so I hope that, sorry, Senator McDonald, I hate to ask you what you. Well, it seems my overall impression is what we're, we're aiming for the same target. Absolutely. We're just doing different different <coughs> path that keeps us part of the clean uh, line. Thank you, Chu. I apologize. We hope to snag a, a word version of the bill and put it in correct formatting. So this is a Sorry. PDF to Word to uh, ed editing from there. Do you have it? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I have a copy of it which is in color, so it's a little easier to see your changes. Um, we should probably walk through them and yep. highlight. Well, and actually, I think that it, even, you have a copy that shows you the Changes. Do you want to walk through what, where, I mean, there's like point, besides carving out the bill into new pieces, there are a number of point edits on the way through. Do you sure. Think? If we want to talk about some of the, def the definitions at first, I think that's probably, so if you'll see it uh, in 586A1, uh, we changed the, the, the definition of a class one and class two substance to align with, um, with, with federal law, um, and so then that it uh, applies um, appropriately. I think we run into issues of conflict there. Um, we changed the, um, the the definition of uh, hydrofluorocarbon to, to more closely match the work that we're doing on through the uh, multi-state process. So we believe that will align with the the ultimate definition that that all states agree to. And a quick question on uh, page two. Yep. Is, uh, my copy of the word retrofit on line two is uh, highlighted. Is that because we're, were we always going to apply to retrofits as well, or is it just that retrofit is uh, the term of art for federal language or that this is becoming? I'm just wondering why retrofit's highlighted. I think it's. That's a good question. I can ask. I can ask that. My guess is that it would. It's a recognition that you are making a change, and so if you're if if it's simply existing, then it's not actually reflecting a change, right? So that's the change from substitute to substance means um, is effectively in the process of changing to an alternative. Uh, there is there whether it's a retrofit or whether it's uh, retrofit of, it, of existing technology or 
By the way, it seems like a plus. So, like, we're retro, not talking about just new equipment. We're also talking right. about retro. So retrofit, I, I think what it does, what it doesn't constitute is, is recharge, <laughs> where we talked about before. Uh -huh. uh, Ms. White from uh, Efficiency Vermont talked about the fact that you can't simply trade one chemical out for another in an existing system. But if you retrofit that system to be able to handle the chemical, then it, the new chemical, then it can be changed. Right. So a recharge being separate. I think that that is the import of that change. Okay, great. Um, and, and that's and that's sort of critical to the ultimate success. Sorry, can you just say a little bit more about the definition change? So you're changing it. To uh, which, which so I'm sorry, uh, hydrofluorocarbon. Yep. So can you just walk us through those changes a little bit? Okay. So you've gotten rid of the manufactured fluorinated gas, is that my reading that correctly? Maybe it's because I don't have it in color. I... Yeah, I, I, I... Colin, do you know how that relates to... Do you have it, Colin? Yeah. However, would you just identify yourself for the record? Sorry. Sure, Colin Smythe and on DEC Air Quality. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but this is language that Megan kind of pulled out of the work that is being done by the Climate Alliance for the states. And, Megan um, is. Megan right. Tool, I'm sorry. Megan Tool, okay. 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 Um, and so I, I think generally hydrofluorocarbons are manufactured fluorinated gases, but I that's don't what I was wondering. know if yeah. that's always true, and so I think they probably this is one of the more sure broadly broad. Okay. broad We're not voting on this today, right? We could have the rich council look into it a little bit. Thanks. The main difference is it's just if the word manufactured is otherwise. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we believe that the definition is broader than what was originally proposed to capture things that might not have been manufactured. So I have a beginner question, and maybe you don't know, maybe you do. Are there naturally occurring hydrofluorocarbons out there? You have ex exhausted the, the technical knowledge of the A and R team. Uh, <laughs> you volunteer. Um, HR HRCs are always. Would you mind just identifying yourself again? We're going to try yeah, to answer yeah, yeah. that. Um, Kristen Campbell, Institute Thanks. for Governance and Sustainable Development. Uh, yeah, HFCs are completely manufactured. They are not naturally occurring. So, may, so you're comfortable with the definition changes? Uh, definition? Yeah, you're going to be speaking. The new definition for HFCs is based on the. It's the same one that's in the CARB regulation. Right. Thank you. Excellent. Which is where the basis of much of the work of the U.S. Climate Alliance is coming from. Is because California is the, had been the furthest along in working on those regulations. Um, we uh, propose to strike um, some language relative to the specificity of related to certain um, certain uses, and simply spell out uh, the uh, in later on in the rulemaking process. Uh, it's easier for me in color too. Um, we found that there was a lot of uh, specificity re related to consumer refrigeration project products and foam blowing, but not all other potential uses of HFCs that we would be proposing to be regulated. And so given that the rules may involve other things, we, we thought it was easier to be silent on the specifics and so that we can, we can, come, we can propose the rule that aligns with your intent rather than and then be constrained by specifics in one area and silence in another, if that makes sense. So you're saying like top of page three and it's in other end uses to get the separate <coughs> <three. coughs> middle of page two. Right. So we're, so, so we're so we propose in in uh, the top of page three the the 
to re, you know, the rules that would reduce hydrofluorocarbon emissions by adopting prohibitions on the use of, and then the substances in, in any, the end uses described, and any other end uses <coughs> based on those cri the criteria that follow, but we remove some of the discussions of in, on page two around around some of the specifics relative to foam and um, and the uh, refer the consumer refrigeration piece. So essentially, from B one uh, down to three B on the previous version. On your version. Mr. Chair, I have a, just a, a note about the phone blowing and the, and the question is asking does this simply copy the California standards here? Um, this is based on so, so Ms. O'Toole and, and, and Colin have been working on the, the regulations and they're based on the California standards. What we are trying to do is make sure that as that process continues forward. There is a specificity in the bill that conflicts with the work of the multi-state effort, so that we're getting to the so there's conflict in where we need to where we ideally would pursue. We're all so working we're towards to, it. So you're trying to write we're trying to write a bill that would follow the California standards, or even if they were changed or be modified. Uh, I I maybe let council can speak to where the specifics of these came from. I don't I don't know the following California standards and adjusting things as when California does it is a practice that has been followed. Are you planning to follow the practice that was previously has been followed? That was so. This does not this specific piece does not refer to the, those don't say that we're going to follow a California standard and then and then continue to follow it going forward you're providing us with the rulemaking authority to, to, to do this work based on these prescriptions as, as the bill has drafted we we would we think that these prescriptions could potentially run in conflict with what California and the other states that are involved in the discussions around a model rule, um, I use that term loosely because it's not necessarily going to be exactly the same in all states, but um, where then to, to move, you know, to move that forward. And so there's no, and, and, and then we wouldn't, our rule would be an individual state rule that wouldn't be tied to the to a California rule, but we would be working together with them on the requirements. And if additional work were needed, then we would continue to work through the subgroup <coughs> within the U.S. Climate Alliance if there's a continued lack of federal action on this on this realm. This realm. Um, just one sort of big picture question: yep. Is there any area in here where the proposed changes you would say are less? Um, Protective than what the original bill proposed. I don't believe so. Uh, to my to my knowledge, it doesn't. Uh, if there aren't. No, I mean it's not our it's our intent to to do exactly what the bill did, which is to take the California, the proposed California standard as a model and build a you know, coalition of the willing around doing that and creating an effective nationwide market. Sir McDonald's. So there are, just, there are kind of two ways to approach the California standards on a variety of things that we mm -hmm. deal with. And one is when they change it, we go along with it. And um, if we don't want to go along with it, we act. And the other one is to not go along with it, and then to have to act and act and act and act for each change, for each part of the change that they make. So which one is this one, the second one? Well, we're not, in neither case are we tying ourselves to California, you know, it, it, you haven't, you have an, it, it rather than in previous iterations of air quality pieces where we tie ourselves to California in some way, shape, or form, where we simply you know pass the the 
do the same reg that they just did. This is not that work. This is a multi-state effort that's actually it's already, the, the California standard is actually based on the federal rule that is, is not being enforced right now. So it's all, it's not really a, California happened to be the first one to do the draft, but there's not, like we shouldn't think about this in the same way. I don't want to think about it differently if we've got to the same conclusions. We are, I mean, <laughs> we are. But there is a difference, it, right? Is, I mean, has have been on LCAR for a while. There are usually two approaches, and this one is a. This one is neither one of those. It's neither one of those. <coughs> and, um, and the reason is we, because it's a special case. I mean, ninety-nine percent of our rules don't follow that that model. So I'm, I think this is closer to what we normally do than. Is part of the okay. challenge that uh, I accept your there, best there, there, to there is not an existing Great. there's not an exist there's not an existing California standard for us to say we simply want to do that. What uh, we're doing here really is just shifting from us doing it immediately in some way to again this sort of being part of a large and it, you're not even really shifting that. You're saying do the same thing. But just do it in it. Do, do allow the larger group to see if it can come to agreement and move forward. That's the the the, the minor date change that we have in there is the only effect really to the timeline associated with this. And that's simply as a as a stopgap to make sure that this process has a chance to play out. But if the process this plays out, I mean, do you worry that it's going to take a longer time? I mean, tell me just the confidence in that it working in terms of the dates. Well, we've been working on this for for six months or so already now. We have a good template in place, I think. Uh, I would ask Colin his general opinion, but it seems like things are moving along pretty well. Yeah, I think they are. Um, I, I can't kind of speak to our regulation, but the, the group as a whole has kind of yeah, I think more or less solidified the, the, the model rule, kind of the general guidelines that states could, could follow if they so choose. Um, and I will also add the kind of an, an added benefit of keeping the consistency between the states is for kind of regulated entities for this program like consistency throughout their markets, and that's definitely a plus for them. So right now, not all of the U.S. climate alliance states are have agreed to move forward with <coughs> regulations, but we're provided we'll be providing the template for everybody to move forward. Right now, it's California, New York, Maryland, Connecticut, uh, and I know other states are considering it: Mass, Delaware, um, Rhode Island. And so I, I don't think any of the you know the, the we create the the market and people are going to build products that align with with that because by itself it's going to be you know forty percent of the of the U.S. market and they're not going to make want to make two products. Is that true about cars? I don't the believe that any manufacturer makes a car that is can can't be sold in California because it's just not worth it. That's sort of encouraging. Well, Someone knows. told me they were still yeah. making two versions for uh, domestic sales, and, uh, which was shocking to me because cars move all over the place. I don't know. They would do that. All right. Well, great. Any other questions for the Deputy Secretary? No, thank you. Thanks for your work with all the states. And it's not easy. It's easy for No, there's lots of captaining that happens. Folks like myself to pick away and say, you know, no, it, it, right no we, we, you know, like all, all of these things, we in the climate, the sort of climate realm, we're significantly more powerful when we use our intellectual muscle in a larger group uh, than trying to do things solely on our own. So, it's often the case. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Avoid, avoid, avoid.
Let's avoid our Hi, questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Something's going wrong today between uh, voting and uh, inviting. <laughs> Ms. Campbell, good morning. Good thanks, morning. For, thanks for coming back. Of course. Happy to be here. Kristen Campbell, the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Um, short background. We are a small nonprofit based in DC and Paris, um, specializing in short lived climate pollution um, as like a fast mitigation strategy. HFCs has always been a huge flagship of what we've done. Um, I've been working, the organization has been working on it since uh, about 2009 when they first started attempting to amend the Montreal Protocol to incorporate HFCs. So, so you've seen these two bills now? I mean, a draft. Change some change in the original one. Yes, I haven't seen all of the changes. There you are. It's kind of sharing a bit to kind of see. Um, and I also pulled up the, uh, in terms of the HF, the definition for HFCs, the revised version is more in line with the CARB regulation that they have been working on. The text is uh, in S30, the previous draft, the unamended draft is more in line with the California law that was already passed by HOCs. So it's just like, there's that distinction between the two um, of how they would go. In terms of how the amendments are so you know, So in terms of uh, striking a number of the language of the specifics, that's just to keep, that would then keep the bill to be more general. And, and okay. The, um, it, so I suppose one version of the question about all this is are we uh, attaching ourselves to um, sort of the best emerging standard for HFCs if we sign on to the Carver uh, Energy Alliance. Um, so, version. what the Climate Alliance is doing is they are taking all of the various actions that have been done, mostly pretty much in California, because they have already taken the action. They have a legislative option through SB 1013, and then they have a regulation option through their CARB initiative, which is now just going to be the CARB SNAP rules. And those were modeled on the rules that were recently partially vacated and then rescinded by the EPA. So the language is already, as has been established, of what end uses can be used, um, what refrigerants should be um, banned, which ones can be substituted in various realms. So there is all of the text and language present. Having a law kind of sets a framework and establishes a timeline and that's what both California has done and S30, I believe, is attempting to do, is just to conceptualize it and make it something that is a definitive action and not uh, a possibility of taking a long time or being an amorphous, we shall get to it. What, so California has a short-lived climate pollutants bill that they did two, well, two and a half years ago. It was passed in 2016. And that's the one where they specified how they, that they were going to reduce HFCs and other short-lived climate pollutants. In doing their bill two years later that was just about HFCs, it was adding a little bit more context and giving a definitive scope and a way for CARB to enact regulation that would meet that target and to make that goal. So the, ref the reason they included the reference of the federal statutes, the federal language, as well as the specific sectors, I think was a lot of guidance to CARB of these are the areas that we would like to focus on because these were the areas that were being focused on at a federal level that are no longer being part of it. Okay, so it sounds like the, the initiative uh, at the state level fills in, uh, it creates a, I mean, we're on the right track to a national well. Uh, a quote unquote national standard that states can sign on to. Correct. Yeah. Uh, as more and more states act, it will you know, provide some impetus for other states to act. And it's also a good signal for industry, though for the most part, industry has already been taking steps. They had already been making progress towards phasing out HFCs because of the previous EPA actions. So. Okay, great. 
Um, uh, any other comments on the changes? Yeah, I think. Or even the, if I made the approach, you yeah. know, whether or not we stick with the underlying bill or if we amend it in terms of, you know, your work and your experience. Um, I'm not entirely sure, you know, if there's one definitive route to go sure, with. Sure. Um, you know, potentially, you know, having the definitions in line with the other states and how they may go is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, the definite, it just really depends on whether you would like the definitions within a legislation to match the regulation itself or to be construed in a more broad fashion. Um, I also am looking at the, the definition of striking out, sub, striking out substitute in favor of substance. I will say that the reason for using substitute part of that of California was in reaction to the Mexican floor uh, ruling. Um, so I think substance, or, substance is a very broad uh, term in this context. And if you're specifying something like HFCs, substance can be too broad. Uh, and as for a definition for the term retrofit, that is also coming out of the CARB regulation, so you can find that information in there. It is helpful to have these things defined. <coughs> I would follow the legislative action on it and allow the regulations to either become to become more specific and more specified as they are developed as a reaction. as possible and um, just a strategy question what can we spell out for ourselves now versus would we be better off as a state I guess in essence by tying ourselves to this larger group effort and staying uh, compatible with the language or the strategies they're uh, developing and from my point of view I'd say something like are we is there what are we giving up by making the change to the proposed new language. Is there anything we're losing that you would have a concern on our behalf that we're giving up something? Ellen Chaikowski, Office of Legislative Council. In drafting this bill initially, <coughs> um, there there were sort of two strategies which you've already hit on. There was a, the this bill as it is right now contains the section two rulemaking provision sort of as a catch-all um, in case this becomes a more dynamic process and rules needed to be um, added to reflect changes. Uh, but initially the sponsor was concerned to, about matching the, the California legislation which has been signed into law as closely as possible, especially because it did contain the, the federal language. Um, and so, uh, it is, it is a policy decision. So the, this bill very closely tracks federal language um, to fill in the hole of the federal language that's been vacated. So uh, going a more broad route, Jeff, by just providing the rulemaking authority um, could, do, doesn't necessarily mean that it won't track 
the federal rules, but um, they're yeah, so. Okay. I suppose you know one way people worry about it is like might we end up with a, a weaker program by virtue of being tied? Is it? I guess we're, there's no judgment one way or the other whether or not the uh, the emerging standard the quote model may be quote unquote stronger or weaker than what we already have in S30. Does that sound fair? Yeah, I'm not certain. Who knows right. where it will go. Right. Okay. Um, if Vermont were to have its own um, language as in at the current version of S30, do we run into any interstate commerce clause problems by regulating to our own standards? Yeah. No, and, and as, so this language is in statute in California, yeah. so it's already it already exists. Um, right. Any other committee questions from our council? All right. uh, so, committee, I don't know where how you want to sort out the path forward um, for we have till tomorrow to do that, but. Anyone have any thoughts? Uh, I, May I just add? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't mind touching base with the, the sponsor, Senator Pearson, yep. seeing, you know, I, I talked to him a little bit yesterday, uh, but I think it might be helpful to, be respectful just to hear maybe a little bit from him, sure. which direction he wants to go in with this. <clears throat> uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's just, one, I think, worthwhile. I mean, I, I'm fine with the, again, the underlying bill, but if people are, uh, you know, there's certainly a case for doing the amended version. Uh, so that's why I think maybe touching base with him. Sure. If, if, if you. <coughs> no, I'm fine with doing it. Maybe once you turn a bill in, you turn a bill in. So. Yeah, no, there's that too. Yeah. Good, yeah I'm good looking change. for kind of some additional guidance around what sort of. What the temperature check is out there with also our colleagues. So, but if, if you would prefer no, I think to ignore the lead sponsor, that's fine. There's the camera. Just <laughs> <laughs> do a quick sweep of the room. <coughs> Pan in. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Senator Peterson crying. Uh, no, anyhow. So, all right. Um, Maybe I, yeah. Uh, check with Senator Peterson. We could even invite him to come to the committee and talk to us about it. I, the, the, uh, maybe the attraction for one, this isn't. Uh, the standard, the substitute track that's being proposed is coming out of, based on the California Air Resources Board right. legislation. So we've hitched our our wagons to, to theirs before since theirs being ignored many, many no. times. With part of Isn't it being ignored? Is it not being? Isn't that what we heard? No. No, the federal. So the federal. Um, the federal it has been be the EPA part has been vacated. So then California adopted it. Mm -hmm. um, so there, but there is sort of a dual track right now. Of CARB has been acting, and it's not entirely in sync with what is in statute. Not that they're in conflict, but there are some some differences. So CARB is working on um, you know the, the the specifics, but California enacted this phase down schedule, which is what is in your bill, and it's. So it's a slight difference, but they're not in Congress, so. Okay. So, so how would you describe the difference between the two? So uh, <coughs> I haven't read most of the CARB uh, regulation, but my understanding of, the, of what happened was CARB started rulemaking, and then uh, this, the legislature be, was concerned because there was uh, because the rule had been vacated and wanted to act to make sure that there wasn't a hole. So they enacted a phase down schedule, and I am not an expert on what is going on now with the interplay, but there is a schedule and statute, and there are um, regulations that are being developed, although I think they are final, but I'm not certain, so. Um, all right, so any other questions? So we'll check with Senator Pearson and find out if you could look into that a little more just so we'll know what the essential difference is between what we would be adopting in the statute US 30 is currently drafted versus if you can highlight any differences you see between what the, the emerging model is. 
that that would be helpful. Um, any other questions for council? Okay. Um, any other comments from anyone in the room with an interest in the bill? Mr. Deputy Secretary, I saw you moving. That's sometimes a signal that someone has something they want to say. Uh, yeah, I, I would simply say that the, ultimately it will be the rules that the, that the products are following to, to meet California standards uh, unless there is a, uh, a, some sort of uh, legal action taken to challenge the difference between the legislation and the rules in California. It is our preference to align with the rules given that that will be the closest Later, right, that, 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 that people are following to, to, meet, to meet the requirements. The thing that this reminds me of some is I think it was last year in 411 or 410 when we had um, um, energy standards for uh, monitor, computer monitors that we adopted a California rule by reference and then although we had to keep on approving it directly so we weren't ceding control of our rules to California, but we attached ourselves to a rule before, probably done it many times, not sure. Okay, okay. all right. So we'll uh, work on it some more and come to a decision about which path to take tomorrow. Thank you very much. So reluctant to say this, but what if we just take a 10 minute break and jump back in at 5 after on um, 1 13? I have a bill up at 11 30, so okay. I'll sneak out. Okay. Okay. And another committee. For sure. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, waiting for council, we have a, a next draft of 1 13. Um, Meanwhile, while do we have that conversion? Yep, mm -hmm. and I put the Okay, all right, so let's let's pass those out so people can start to take a look. Uh, Mr. O'Grady will get here, we'll do a walkthrough. Thank you. And some tuning necessary. Uh, the other thing you'll find in your folder is that um, we have, in the current version of the bill, it names polystyrene as a substance to be included in the band. And um, uh, since then, one of the things that we had was some testimony that left people uncertain as to what the right choices around managing polystyrene better might be. And so part of our discussion was maybe that becomes one of the things considered by the working group. So then we developed more details about how the working group's composed, what its charge is, et cetera. Um, over, uh, as, a, as so uh, not unusual this time of year to have someone say, um, I have other information that may make you reevaluate that potential change. So uh, we have a packet, the top sheet is the Sierra Club packet. Mr. Burns will be speaking <coughs> for that information. And I think the point of it is that um, uh, some people believe that there is enough information to distinguish expanded polystyrene from other things to go ahead and make that change now. And if Mr. Reyes, if you could join us at the table. Thank you very much for two rounds of editing in less than 24 hours on S113. If you could uh, walk us through the most current version of the bill, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. So does everyone have draft 2.1 dated today at 846? Yes. Okay. Um, so section one, you still have that new subchapter of law being added to the solid waste chapter. That, but it is now no longer addressing uh, anything that's related to polystyrene. 
It's now single-use carry-out bags and single-use plastic straws. So there's the definition of carry-out bag. It remains the same. A bag provided by a store or service, food service establishment to a customer at the point of sale for the purpose of carrying groceries or retail goods. Definition of disability in food service establishment and plastic remain the same as the secretary, but the definition of single use, it was focused on uh, to be used to um, for a beverage or a food, uh, and now it is uh, more generic. So it means a product that is designed and intended to be used only once and is generally recognized by the public as an item that is to be discarded after one use. Store definition remains the same. Page two, line 11, you'll now see why single use was changed because in the prohibition for carry out bags, it had previously just been a prohibition on plastic carry out bags. Now it's a prohibition on single use plastic carry out bags. That's because you could have read the previous prohibition as applying to reusable plastic bags. Um, and that's how the New Jersey bill, which was this was based on, that's how the New Jersey bill was drafted, but I think this is a refinement if you don't want to address reusable bags. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, on page two, line 14 and 15, for the provision on single-use plastic straws, uh, the exception had previously been about medical condition or disability. Um, it's now to a person upon request. Uh, the chair and I uh, made that change this morning. Uh, I failed to make the conforming change of removing the de definition of disability. You no longer need that. Um, uh, the penalties remain the same. Um, the rulemaking remains the same. And then there is a brand new section on the working group. It's not focused on the plastic bags. It's about um, a single use products working group. Um, there are uh, definitions, carry out bag, disability, disposable plastic food service where standard producer responsibility, they'll all get used in the um, creation of the working group, which is on page five. Um, so there is created a single use products working group to evaluate current state and municipal policy and requirements for management of unwanted single use products. We will recommend to the General Assembly policy requirements that the state should enact to improve statewide management of, <coughs> of single use products divert single-use products from disposal and landfills and prevent contamination of natural resources by discarding single-use products. Um, the membership, it's a member of the Senate appointed by the committee and committees, a member of the House appointed by the Speaker, um, the Secretary of Natural Resources or designee, a representative from a single stream materials recovery facility located in Vermont appointed by the Governor, Two representatives of the SWIMMIES, uh, appointed by the Committee on Committees, one representative from the League, appointed by the Speaker, one representative of an association representing manufacturers or distributors of single products, one representative of environmental advocacy groups located in the state, um, appointed by the Speaker, two representatives of stores or food service establishments in the state appointed by the Committee on Committees. Um, and then you'll see the powers and duties. They'll evaluate the success of the existing state and municipal requirements for management of unwanted single-use products, including a life cycle analysis of the management of single-use products from production to ultimate dis disposition. They'll estimate the cost of management by the state and municipalities of uh, unwanted single-use products, um, and they'll estimate other costs of the management or failure to manage unwanted single-use products, including the effects on landfill capacity. They'll summarize the effects on the environment and natural resources of failure to manage single-use products um, appropriately, uh, 
including propensity to create litter, effects on human health from toxic substances that originate in unwanted single-use products. I'm making some, I didn't have time to proofread it this morning, and so I'm proofing as I'm reading. Um, on page seven, line three, uh, they will recommend methods or mechanisms for improving the life cycle management of single-use products in the state, including whether the state should establish EPR requirements for manufacturers, distributors, or brand owners. Um, if EPR uh, for single-use <coughs> products are recommended, um, the group shall recommend the single-use products to be included under the requirements, a financial incentive for manufacturers, distributors, or brand owners of single-use products to minimize the environmental impacts. The environmental impacts considered will include greenhouse gas emissions from the production, use, and recovery of single-use products. The group will recommend how to structure a requirement um, to provide for finance, the collection, processing, and recycling of single-use products. Uh, using the existing infrastructure where feasible. Um, that's basically a standard for all of your EPR programs. Page eight, line one, they will also give you an estimate of the costs and benefits of any recommended method or mechanism for improving the management of single-use products in the state. Moving on on page eight, line four, the group gets the assistance of ANR, the Department of Health, Ledge Council, and JFO. On page eight, line eight, they have a report to you by December 1 of 2019 with the findings and recommendations under sub D. The Office of Ledge Council calls the first meeting and the committee shall select a chair at the first meeting. The working group ceased to exist on February 1, 2020. That. You get reimbursement. Uh, other members that aren't uh, <coughs> legislators get reimbursement if they're not otherwise uh, compensated. And then on page nine, line four, no more than six meetings. And then page nine, line 13 and 14, the act would be renamed an act relating to the management of single use products. Do we have a fiscal note? Cost um, for, for the cost of running the working group. Oh, uh, we do not. But I can. I think yeah. we should ask. For I'll ask about on the floor. Somebody will. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to go yeah. to appropriations. Yeah. It will <coughs> because of that. <coughs> right. Okay. Yeah. It will go to a folks and everything. Yeah, that's valid. All right. So. Uh, I'll check in with the pistol. I'm going to maybe give us a, a figure for that. Yeah. Related to that question, is there anything else joint fiscal should look into regarding this? Um, well, they're going to be part of the working group, so. So ahead of time, nothing really, just the cost for the working group itself. Um, I, I think that's up to you. That's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Senator McDonald. I was, I think it's pretty much as the, what I had in my head yesterday. And is, is there, I took were notes we running what you in, said. Pardon? I took I know, notes, I think. Thank you. So greenhouse gases are they synonymous all the time with the amount of carbon or if you're producing something that weighs three times as much and you're all in a thousand miles as that. I wouldn't want to. I'd like the committee to take a look at that stuff and then, and then, and then give a whole picture and not have her come back and say, well, gee, you have this, you have the greenhouse gases, but that doesn't include. Uh, you know, so, truck, you, truck you, you, it could be the effect on climate change. Um, is that what you're looking at? I want to make perhaps a. You're on page is, is it, Yeah, but. That's one of the things we're going to look at. Yeah. And it, it ought to be clear. Okay. Can, can you, do you have an edit to offer? We're in live edit mode, so. And I just hate to spend the time and the effort and then to come back and have uh, Mr. Brad Bradford come in and say, well, you didn't include these 
these things that he had had on his packaging. Right. Oh, I see. So add climate change right into that last. <coughs> he was one of the first witnesses that we had that, that looked at um, a variety of different aspects about the products, mm -hmm. not just one or two salient yeah. aspects. So you could change that sentence to say the environmental impacts um, shall include uh, analysis of the effects on climate change from production, use, and recovery of single-use products. Production, use, yes. Does production, use, and cover, recovery cover transportation? That's um, not climate change. Well, recovery would, wouldn't it? Well, does it? I mean, it, because it's it's trucked from the manufacturer to the user. It's trucked from the user to the store. You want to put transport in there? I think it's a big it's fine. part of the yeah. overall yeah. formula. Yeah. 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 Are not available, or we looked into it and it was negligible? Yeah, or? but we at least they look into it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And I think part of I don't know if it's in the right place or if it would carry over. When we added life cycle analysis, it was it just from creation through final disposition was to get exactly at that. Yeah. Let's track the whole thing, not just look at a piece of it and make come to wrong conclusions because we're not looking at enough yeah. data. Okay. So, do you have is that sufficiently clear based on those two comments? What the edit? I'm just trying to make sure that council has clear direction from the committee. I feel clearly directed. <laughs> <laughs> Transparent. <laughs> I, I have a question about one of the, the members on the working group. Um, it says a member from the single use industry. Uh, I don't know um, but I didn't know if we wanted to be a little more um, Specific there, you know, representative association or group representing manufacturers distributors of single use products. If we wanted to actually talk about, you know, polystyrene or, or like specifically, because if we put a manufacturer just like plastic bat, you know, there's a lot of single use. It's very broad, but I think we're trying to get to one. It's page six, it's line three to five. I just didn't know if we wanted to tighten that up. Just okay. single use could be a could be right. Green Mountain Coffee with their K cups, and they're they're a product that we're not even talking about here. So that's my point of should we be well, specific to? <laughs> there is a definition of single use say, product. Okay. We define single use. Are we out on K cups this year? No. no. I haven't touched K cups. <laughs> so it's single use carry out okay. bags, single use packaging, single use disposable plastic food serviceware. Printed materials and um, but again, Green Mountain coffee would be a yeah, single so food service. service. So I'm like, we want to get right to the specific like poly. Di I mean, that specific industry is I'm guessing what we want what least their expertise. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to tighten that up a little bit. Okay. Well, and um, and we also want to have whoever it is uh, have a broad enough perspective so that they're not just looking at. Right. If they're polystyrene people, we want the whole range of plastics as well as non-plastic choices at the, in the discussion. So, right. um, but I just worry that <coughs> another industry just might come on and, and push one so that their single-use product isn't brought up in the study. I think we want to actually talk about the product we're trying to get at here. Sorry. So the same thing in the last two appointees of the stores and the restaurants that who get what's decided and have to deal with it, and they're in there too, so they might push back on that. So can you just tell me what the, the actual change that you would like in the <coughs> I, I mean, I would just like to say somebody who maybe makes, you know, maybe a, uh, I'm not trying to exclude, like I basically don't see the need, we don't need a straw manufacturer, we don't need a, a plastic bag, but someone who actually makes, I'd like to see someone who makes the polystyrene or an association that represents a group that makes at Polystyrene, because I think what has opened our eyes as a committee, somebody from the industry coming in and saying, hey, these two are the same product, They're made differently, but wait when you consider all the other options. I think having that voice, I mean, it's one voice of 15, so it's not like they're gonna have a ton of weight. It's just giving that voice more specifically to, to that. I think it would help the committee come to a better result. Well, it's 
So I, I'm not dismissing it, just but as a reminder, the the uh, working group will call on sorts. Of, I mean, and take testimony from a lot of different people. So I think it would I'm pretty confident not make the mistake of only hearing from one group and leave out other manufacturers. Yeah. But but they're going to call on environmental groups too, so we could. Right. Well. Okay. So we'll have Mr. Bradford in here probably for someone like him missing the boat. If you, it's an association or group representing, so we're trying to get that broad perspective mm -hmm. there. I just try. I'm almost concerned that we'd get too narrow. That's I think broad is what we're looking for here, right? We don't want someone who's you know uh, thinks polystyrene is the answer. We want someone who knows the whole plastics industry, so that we can look at. Well, we want a guy that was here, like the guy who was here yesterday. Yeah, yeah, who was able to yeah. sort out a bunch of different ones. Um, okay. So if you'll mull that over. Um, yeah, I mean, that is just my concern. I think it's too broad because I just think you could put someone from Green Mountain Coffee on there and say you check that box, and they're not necessarily a specialist in polystyrene or. Right. Um, well, it's a gubernatorial appointee. So I'm thinking they'll put respond to the, the goal uh, and pick someone who's the right sort of person. I, I actually thought about the just appointing one single business. That's why it says an association or group representing. So I, I, th I thought about that. I, don't, I, don't, I understand it doesn't meet your needs, but I, I'm just trying to, trying to get so we know we're going to have another draft for tomorrow um, for voting. And if you think of something in, um, in between. Yep, I'll get it to make it Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Any, any other questions for council about the, the new version? Thank you very much. I do want to get it proofed as I want to approve it myself. So yeah. I didn't have that opportunity this morning, and then I want to have to approve the other day. Okay. So the only, based on what you were saying, I see uh, a definition <laughs> of disability on page 1, line 16. Yeah, it should come out of the working group. Right. And then recurse well. later on page 3. Um, I thought I heard you insert the word appropriately. Yeah, there, there's, there's, that would be on page 6. Line 20. Um, you also wanted Senator Rogers request to change on page 7, line 14 and 15. You wanted Senator McDonald's change in that same language and changing it from greenhouse gas and climate change effects. Um, and there's some little typo things here and there as well. Okay, great. All right, anything else for council? Thank you very much. You want me to stay or? Um, <laughs> probably, right? If, no. you, if you can <laughs> see. Well, I think it's knowing how we each. <laughs> what he was really saying is, can I get out of here? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to maybe hear the uh, next one. So, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Burns, can you join us? We have that extra information that I think basically argues for not removing <coughs> uh, a ban on polystyrene from the bill, which is the direction it's evolved, and that we be investigating polystyrene amongst other plastics we, we in the for that or no? No, it's just being considered. So the the track that we just went through includes it. It includes single use plastic bags, straws, and, and then. All the other plastics are rolled into, right. figured out through the work. No, I understand group. that. So you're thinking, get rid of these now. There's no get separate rid. amendment for this, for what Mr. Burns is going to address. Well, we don't have any separate amendment. That's right. what I'm asking you. No, there's no separate amendment. But I wanted right. to have a chance to hear the case. I'll, I'll just speak frankly. You know, we have plastics one through seven. I think it is, and then am I getting it right? Polystyrene seven and. Uh, 
anyway, uh, in the world of polystyrene, there's expanded, there's extruded, there's sheet, and I think that I heard about one other variety of it yesterday. So for, um, for me as someone who uh, introduced a bill, I'm thinking, okay, if I can't clearly articulate why we would pick one type of polystyrene uh, for a ban at this moment, and not be silent on the other types of polystyrene and one through six, and I don't feel like I'm in a position to yeah. ar argue for the bill. Yeah. So um, it seems like there's more learning to be done, and the deeper dive would be exactly the kind of thing that a working group could do. However, overnight, basically, I heard, well, I think polystyrene may actually be more of a problem than you think, and you may want to reconsider moving into working group. So that's what that's what we're here to learn more about. So thank you for chipping in. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. For the record, Paul Burns, Executive Director of BEEPER, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to the issue of the polystyrene. Before I jump immediately to that, I, I just wanted to know that with regard to the working group, um, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I was thinking that the, that, you, that the committee may be heading in a different direction with regard to members of the working group and not having individual members of the public representing associations, et cetera. Um, so I'm now understanding that that's in there, um, I guess I would just uh, urge you to consider the possibility of having, since there are at least a couple of representatives from the industry or manufacturing side of things and you have one environmentalist, you might also consider the fact that whatever we do in this area is not just an environmental issue but kind of a consumer protection issue as well. So some, if you were open to the idea, my suggestion would be a representative of a consumer advocacy organization because there are a few pieces of legislation that you consider that probably affect as many people in um, as clear a way as this legislation is likely to and as potential future legislation is likely to. Not just as a means of protecting the environment or addressing climate issues, but you know, how do people go shopping or what, how do they see their uh, products packaged or uh, what kind of trash are they left with at the end of uh, you know, opening up a product at home. So I think those are distinct issues that you may want to consider. I would, I would urge you to, to do so as you think about the makeup of that working group. Okay. Now, uh, let well, me tell you, overnight that group has gotten bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, so. <laughs> okay. I understand. Pretty, it's getting pretty big. Yeah. 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 So um, with respect to the uh, expanded polystyrene, uh, I think the question is the, the right one. Is there a distinction that one can reasonably make between this material and the other kinds of plastics that are that we think of as uh, uh, making up uh, the broad term of single-use plastics? Uh, I want to give credit to Jen Duggan of Conservation Law Foundation. I know that she sent to the committee a number of uh, items and attachments. Uh, here's your uh, an initial attention of just the email itself that she sent uh, to you, Senator Bray. Um, and then I wanted to turn to one, at least uh, one of the specific documents. But just going from that. Sorry, so much, I know we yeah. don't have paper copies of that email, do we? I do not have one. Okay, it's one of four, uh, I think we were all happy done it. This was mm -hmm. just the, uh, yeah, the email done. itself yeah. that, uh, that Jen Duggan sent. So there are eight bullet points. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to wait? Please. No, go ahead. So under the first heading of polystyrene foam is one of the most pl toxic plastics. This is, again, a, a feature that I would think that the committee would be uh, very interested in. Out of the large, or she writes, out of the large array of plastics sold on the market, polystyrene foam is one of the most dangerous. Benzene, a carcinogen, is the building block of polystyrene, is released during the manufacture of the material and in the incineration process to the, to the extent that these materials are uh, incinerated upon disposal, exposing workers and communities to dangerous toxic chemicals. Polystyrene quickly breaks down into small particles that are widely dispersed in the environment due to its light weight. These microplastics cause physical and neurological toxicity in smaller organisms. Under the second heading, polystyrene foam cannot be recycled and contaminates other valuable recyclables. So this is now moving away from just the idea of how toxic the material is, but to the problems that it causes if less left in um, our, our manufacturing stream and the, the kind of consumer stream where people are generating the stuff and even taking it back for recycling. Polystyrene foam cannot be recycled on a large scale, even if it is recyclable in theory, because it must be clean, which means no food residue, 
a clean foam cannot be collected curbside because it crumbles in that process into tiny pieces. Because it breaks down during the sorting process, polystyrene foam contaminates other valuable recyclables. I'll have more to say on that in a moment. Polystyrene foam has no value as a raw material and cannot be sold for profit after it is recycled. Recycling polystyrene foam is also a very energy intensive process. She then goes on to note that there are a number of places that have already been, because it is toxic, because it fouls up the, the recycling stream, uh, a number of areas, uh, uh, states <coughs> and other jurisdictions in the country have taken action to ban polystyrene, including most recently the uh, state of Maryland. In addition, hundreds of cities and towns across the country have banned this dangerous plastic, including 16 towns in Maine, 30 towns in Massachusetts, New York City, in several other cities in New York, Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, San Francisco, other cities and counties in California, Washington, D.C., and others. We would not be alone in taking this action then to address the problem of expanded polystyrene. There, so, Mantra, yes. so these are worse than the other significantly worse than the other. From an environmental, from a public health standpoint, the answer would be yes, they are more dangerous, they are more toxic. The building blocks of polystyrene are themselves, generally speaking, more toxic than other kinds of plastic. Because of what the material is and how it is handled, it, it creates other problems in, at a material recovery facility, for instance, if you leave it in for recycling. So when we say that you can't recycle your way out of the problem of so much plastics that we generate, I know you've heard that multiple times in yeah. testimony so far, it is perhaps most true when you're talking about expanded polystyrene uh, because that creates the biggest problems. Not only that it can't be recycled effectively, and that there is no market for this stuff, uh, but that it follows up paper recycling if you put it in with paper together at the material recovery facility. Wish it would. You had a couple of those you could hold up so we knew it. Yeah, I know that. Well, I'll, I'll Google up. You think about the clamshell for, yeah. uh, that McDonald's used to use for hamburgers. You know, it used to all come in a polystyrene clamshell yeah. thing. Is that the same thing with cafeteria? Do we need to eat? Yes. yes. I think it is. Yeah. Those are coated paper yeah. now. Those yeah. are coated paper yeah. now. So they, they used, used to have They used to have them. Yeah. Many places. Beer coolers? That's it. The throwaway beer coolers? No, everybody's getting them. Yeah. 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 Some of those are made of polystyrene, yes. But well, they are. The great is The great, right. And they're. So this is a. popcorn. This is a material that I have to say, you know, I mean, McDonald's moved, I don't know when McDonald's moved away from the use of polystyrene, but it was a long time ago. It was because there were a number of campaigns out there urging them to move away from this because it is, it's very bad. I, I'm not gonna go through all the information that uh, uh, Jen Duggan supplemented with her testimony, but you've got information from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which goes through polystyrene. It's a lot of information there. Um, that you could look at. The Sierra Club has information regulating the use of polystyrene in food items, um, and there are other materials that we have and could give you that, that back up what I'm saying. But I think that if you were to read one of the attachments, one most interesting might be from the Supreme Court of the state of New York, um, New York County. This uh, actually is an interesting case, and it goes to many of the very questions that you're asking, Mr. Chairman. You see that this is a question um, brought by petitioners who were essentially uh, arguing that the uh, commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation had erred in her decision, which said essentially that this uh, poly expanded polystyrene material uh, cannot be recycled in an environmentally effective and economically feasible manner. That was the decision of the Department of Sanitation in New York City. It was challenged by the industry who said, no, 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 it can be recycled. It, it, is, it can be done in an efficient, effective, um, environmentally sound manner. And so that, these were the very questions at issue in this case. And, in, and if you go through this, this document, it's really interesting, going over to page five uh, the, of the evidence here, the judge in this decision recounts all of the evidence presented by the commissioner of the Department of Sanitation. 
Uh, the first speaks to a 30-year history of failure for subsidized markets for foam recyclers. Uh, uh, and it, it talks here about the fact that there is excessive contamination when you're collecting this material. Commissioner pointed to Canadian municipalities that ended their post-consumer plastics recycling because of the bad economics of collecting, handling, and shipping food service foam, which is the polystyrene foam. The second point is that there are no markets for recycled post-consumer foam. Uh, quoting a report by the economist, an economist and expert uh, witness in the case states, given the lack of demand for recycled post-consumer expanded polystyrene foam and the high cost of converting dirty EPS, expanded polystyrene foam, into a marketable product, there is no evidence of a market for this material. The evidence goes on. The commissioner presented a 2015 material recovery facility flow study released um, in 2016 analyzing the flow of plastic bottles, cups, conta plastic containers, and plastic clamshells made of different resins. Only 7% of the food service foam products ended up in the proper bales after going through the sorting machines. 7%, that is a demonstration of the problem if you leave this material in at a recycling facility. They had a high loss rate because they flattened out or broke into pieces the polystyrene foam. Given this poor performance, the commissioner surmised that should New York City switch to a single stream recycling process, which we have in most of our state, but not all of our state, 60 to 75% of the food service polystyrene would contaminate the paper stream. So 60 to 75% of the stuff, if you leave it in with all of your other recyclables, is going to end up contaminating the paper that you're trying to recycle at the material recovery facility, according to the evidence in this case. Can I ask a question before you go in? Right. Is there any uh, statistics similar to the uh, to this for the other plastics that are going through the same stream? Uh, I I don't know what I believe they would be in that study, but because this case was specifically about the expanded polystyrene foam, I don't have that for okay. you today. So it's just the lightweight stuff you got now. It's not the heavier. That's right. This, that's, they're making the case that it is explicitly <coughs> how this plastic is different yeah. from the other kinds of plastic. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. It goes on. I'm not going to go through uh, every point here, but I think each one is essentially a paragraph on one or more of the problems that you see with polystyrene foam. The fifth. Uh, is about how polystyrene foam is not recyclable, and they, and they go on. The seventh, research on cities that collect foam with recycling, and I think this is worth noting. The commissioner presented four cities in California, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Riverdale, and Sacramento, and six jurisdictions in Ontario, Canada, uh, to show that while these municipalities collect expanded polystyrene foam, they do not recycle it. From its research and through interviews, the Department of Sanitation in New York learned that these jurisdictions uniformly complain about the cost of trying to recycle foam. The problem for the material recovery facilities uh, that they have in sorting foam is that it contaminates other product streams and the lack of market for food service foam. Further, as reported by the study uh, that the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council submitted in this case in February of 2016, 28 major cities in the United States ranked by population, of, of 28, uh, of the 28 major cities in the U.S. ranked by population, only three cities had designated foam as recyclable. Los Angeles, San Antonio, and Jacksonville. San Antonio no longer accepts food service uh, material or, uh, or the solid block expanded polystyrene foam, which would be, I believe, like the, uh, the coolers. Jacksonville no longer accepts any expanded polystyrene foam for recycling. Uh, Where's it go? That goes to landfill. I've seen it swept <laughs> up, and swept up in little pieces and burned because that was the easiest way to get rid of them. That's, that's not. And as uh, as noted, if you burn this material, that's when you also release some of the toxins that you know that, that make it particularly dangerous. Um, I, I'm almost uh, done, but um, the eighth point here goes to foam contaminates organics and is the leading plastic pollutant in New York Harbor. Uh, Department of Sanitation New York, various studies and research led the commissioner to conclude that food service expanded polystyrene 
uh, is hard to collect because they break up into small pieces. They are hard to sort and that they contaminate other valuable resource streams. They are hard to store because they must be stored for months in order to amass enough of the lightweight material that it can be shipped economically. And it's hard to find a market for any food service expanded polystyrene. The conclusion after all of this um, that, that the judge makes in this case is that the commissioner's rejection of the petitioner's proposal and its finding that the food service EPS, expanded polystyrene, cannot be recycled in an environmentally effective and economically feasible manner is rational. Indeed, as presented by the evidence, the 2017 determination is was a, quote, painstakingly studied decision and was in no way rendered arbitrarily and capriciously. And therefore, the judge upheld the decision of the New York City Department of Sanitation Commissioner. I, it seems to me that, the, that all of the arguments in this case, which again, painstakingly um, uh, research. <coughs> All of this evidence goes exactly to the questions that this committee is trying to grapple with. Is this plastic different? I think the answer is yes. Um, is it more toxic? It is, is it more problematic from an environmental and public health standpoint? I think the answer is yes. And does it create itself problems that are even more difficult to deal with than other forms of plastic? Yes, and in so doing, it jeopardizes even the other kinds of materials that we're trying to recycle curbside. You can't recycle your way out of polystyrene, uh, and it is, in fact, an environmental benefit to, to move as rapidly as we can to get it out of the waste stream entirely, out of commerce entirely. Uh, Sir McDonald, that's our candidate. Do you have concerns that the committee's working group would, would fail to be persuaded by what you just told us? Or should we be preempting them? Or should we be a signal that says, take a real good look at I, I, plastic from across the tracks. For the same reason that the committee has been persuaded that it's time to take action on bags and straws, I think the evidence is there to support action at this time on polystyrene foam, particularly the food service polystyrene foam. Um, I do think that this is persuasive information that would convince more than a year from now the uh, the committee, or less than a year from now, but would convince the committee through its actions to recommend you take action. I, I think you've got the evidence now, and you could you could get a jump on it. I guess. How do you phrase it? So, uh, like so. Well, I mean, as I think of, if I think about a hybrid, you could say the bill started with a, a ban on expanded polystyrene. If, if we included such a thing, and it's effective July of twenty. You could ask the working group to evaluate whether or not that was uh, an appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate choice or something like that. But then we're not really asking for an open-minded study group. We've already said, yeah, we want to ban it because we don't. The testimony we we heard has at least me asking, are we doing the appropriate thing? Because I understand the concern he has, but a red solo cup and a Dunkin' Donuts coffee cup are the same thing ultimately. So my question was, should we be open-minded towards this product or should we? Um, I think we be, let the process be, go. I mean, it's not like we're not going to be back here next year talk, looking at the study and if we decide then. Well, I, I don't, if you're going to have the New York City Trash Department yeah, but New York City weeks and weeks of hearings, if we're going to duplicate that, that's a New York City's also banning me on Mondays in public schools. I'm just a little <laughs> over to the far on a lot of things. So yes, I'm not looking at New York City. They also like, don't fix their potholes, so right. uh, and, and they can't get rid of snow when it's an inch deep. So let's right. pause for a moment. So 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 Senator Senator Campion had his hand one. up three minutes ago. No, so I mean, at this point, I, for one, I'm not interested in adding more people to the working group, but I do think we should take the step and ban this. The evidence is here. Why would we would we wait? Um, this is, I think, personally. I mean, given the documents here, this is an incredibly toxic material. I know I come from a particular region that has been exposed to these things and might be overly sensitive to these kinds of toxics. Uh, but 
you know, they've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. We're far from the first, it looks like. 16 towns in Maine, 30 towns in Massachusetts, number of different cities and municipalities across the country. So I'm more than comfortable with pulling off the Band-Aid, but um, so that's where I'm at. Okay. This is a serious thing. Yep. Senator Rogers? No whole state yet, though. Uh, Maryland, Maryland. Maryland. Oh, really? Yeah, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Like they don't count. Because <laughs> they start with him. Yeah, unless it starts with N or down, Rogers doesn't count. Nebraska, Nebraska had done it. Okay. So that's that's where I'm at. Yeah. I'm happy to work on an amendment uh, if people are interested. Um, Would this include, it says for the food service, does that include grocery stores too? That was yeah. I think there's a uh, carry out, you know, the counter thing. Deli right. stuff. Um, that? Also, yeah. uh, you know, a meat. That's where a lot of it comes from, meat is the meat section, right? Fish uh, counters or whatever section. But are you thinking? So when I think of it, I think when you go into a grocery store and you might get some pre-made stuff, then no, you take yeah, it. No, if you go to the, thinking, the, yeah, if you go to the meat counter, your chicken thighs are on a styrofoam tray, oh, yeah. wrapped in plastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that's where the lion's share of the styrofoam comes from, because everybody that walks into that grocery store that buys meat is walking out with one. Um, I think there should be a transition period. I'm sure people have this stuff sadly on their shelves. And well, they've also like got a stockpile of it. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 Date of 2020. 2020. Right. Fits yeah. the transition. Fits period. that transition period. Right. But is that, the, like this is is that the intent? Is it just the restaurant carryout, or is it the intent of the bill, the grocery stores, it, uh, everybody that's using the Trace. Yeah. Well, so as I initially as I, the, in the underlying bill, yeah, the underlying bill when I had that drafted it was for grocery stores, uh, deli counters, restaurants, carryouts, wherever you're going to encounter that kind of plastic, it was going to be regulated. Other than that, like the very small stores were carved out right under a thousand square feet. We never came back to that one to see if that made sense or not, but uh, that was based again um, uh, looking at. Other, other legislation. And again, these are carcinogens, yes. these are serious thing. I, I, I'm fine with Dan, you know, taking the step and doing the transition to 2020. In fact, I'm gonna throw a question over here. I'm gonna make a motion. Let's let's do it. Well we have hold it. Wait, am I gonna be told now to then you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be bold. Stop it. There's no way to just ship these to third world countries. That's not available as an option. Well, if you throw them in the river, don't exactly. <laughs> that's what's. Yeah. All right. So, so there's a motion on the table. Yeah. So we have the we haven't settled on a, a, a final version yet. We did a lot of work on the draft we went through today. It seemed like everyone was in sync on supporting that. Now, really, the question is, would we return to it, go to a a final version that reinstates, re uh, inserts earlier language uh, based on um, poly expanded polystyrene flow. And so uh, as a straw poll, uh, you know, the charge to, to Mr. Burns and Jen was, uh, can you convince us that this is a um, prudent thing to do? Yeah, I think really. And so I find myself persuaded. I'd still want to study these. Do you I want me to take my motion off the table? No, I, I mean, I just want it for a strong yeah. poll. I mean, I want to see if people I, are open to making that change uh, in our final version right. that we'll see with, tomorrow. With the date get drafted 2020? With the date 2020. With the date of 2020. And we could explicitly modify what the working group looks at to say, is there any reason to um, reevaluate or modify that, that ban on that particular type of plastic? And would the intention be, if you went mean, that way, cheap, that it would be all polystyrene and motion in stores and restaurants. Okay. So unless someone wants to make a, an argument for it, exceptions that I'm not aware of, other than I know that- No, I think it uh, makes sense our, if you're gonna do it, you do it. Right. And early, the, again, you know, so you pick up a, a, a version of a bill from someplace else, as I said, the first version we went to came from New Jersey. 
that explicitly uh, exempted meat and fish uh, when, when it was raw foods in contact with foam. I don't know why. Um, that was actually one of the exposures that you were talking about that to me seemed like the it's most nice. common. You're always seeing stuff on trays. You buy two apples, sometimes they're, mm -hmm. they're shrink, shrunk wrapped to a tray, something like that. Um, so uh, personally, I would be in favor of being broader and not exempting the. So let's do two things. One is, are people uh, open to seeing that um, another version of the bill tomorrow that reinstates the polystyrene, expanded polystyrene the foam the language that you propose. with, yes. right, put it into the working group, and it has a date 15, 16 months out. Yes. Okay. So all those open to that uh, version of the bill, can you say yes? Okay, so we have four yeses. So let's go ahead and I'll connect with uh, Mr. O'Grady. So I'm gonna to just take my motion off the table just okay. officially, so. All right, and then we'll, I'll work with <laughs> Michael to have the final version include language from the earlier version. I would also though encourage everyone um, uh, to, if you have the time, or try to make the time, to read through the materials we got just so that we're all feeling better informed before we go ahead. But it was uh, very helpful information. Makes a difference. Senator Rogers, good regular point. We, I feel, continue to poison ourselves on this list. And this is a good step forward to stopping doing that. Okay. Good. okay. Well, the Committee process is not always entirely straight, but uh, we are making progress. So um, I wanted to pause, and I don't know if there is anyone uh, else in the room who had, had seen the draft we went through that wants to offer uh, comments on the draft we've walked through, plus the um, uh, amendment that we're talking about making to that final version. So does anyone here want to speak? We'll be voting a final bill out tomorrow. Yes? For the, if you can. can I join you or shall I sit here? Uh, if you would oh, like to join us. Yeah, please. It's, join it's, it's not probably started from <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah. uh, for the record, um, Alison Crowley Mag with Morrison Mag representing the American Chemistry Council and I appreciate the committee's um, work on this thus far. I'd like to speak to just uh, briefly what happened just now with Mr. Burns having the opportunity to come up and present um, information to this committee and having a vote taken before industry had a chance to look at it or to respond to any of the states and or municipalities that he referenced as passing. Um, and I apologize, just so you know, it wasn't a, it was just a start. <clears throat> My motion was taken off the table. I understand, yeah. but yesterday I thought was a very collaborative meeting and the different industry folks that came in and showed the different types of of plastics and polystyrenes, I think it's important for the working group to work through that and not the committee to put the cart before the horse and determining that that ban should be in there. So just that for the record. Um, the draft itself, I just had a an opportunity to briefly look at it and um, I do have some concerns with the references to extended producer responsibility that's listed in the bill. Um, EPR, Given the makeup of the committee, I have a sense that that's the directive that probably will most likely come back to this committee is EPR, and I would just, I would um, respectfully request that those um, directives be stricken from the bill as far as telling the committee to take a look at it and bring that back. I just think it should be a more collaborative approach. So those are my comments. Okay. Thank you for the um, uh, well, opportunity. Yeah. So it as it uh, you know we're. You know how it goes when you're in the editing phase, mm -hmm. closing in on a deadline. Mm -hmm. So uh, just as um, Mr. Burns and Ms. Duggan responded to an earlier draft that was proposing to remove uh, a ban or trim that part back out, I um, welcome the, you know, the opportunity for you folks to speak to the committee before we uh, make a final decision. We strongly oppose with that, that proposal. <laughs> I understand. Um, the extended producer responsibility thing, I think, was grew out of our conversation where we said, rather than respond to waste once it's already in the stream, could we think ahead and um, try to reduce the amount of waste generated 
from the outset. I understand. I yeah. just want to put that on the record as well, that we had concerns with that language in the, coming out of this draft. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else in the room want to um, speak to any of the, uh, the draft? Okay. So, committee, you had your hand up, right? I just have a couple yeah. oh, yeah. questions. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Erin um, Segrist, Vermont Retail and Brochures. I, um, just one question on clarification. My question was the previous, the original bill um, exempted grocery stores um, the the meat um, packaging. Right. So, are you talking about exempting the meat packaging again, or are you talking about completely banning all expanded valley starting? Um, the next draft was uh, is uh, I understood that consensus of the committee was to be banning uh, polystyrene completely. So polystyrene, the, not the just expanded. Expanded, expanded okay. polystyrene. Okay. So that would include those meat trays. Yes. And egg cartons. So for the record, we are significantly opposed to this. Um, it's going to increase costs to uh, the, the cost of consumers' foods. Um, we understand that there, there is concern, but um, preliminary reaction to this is that we are, we are opposed to um, a full-out ban on extended, expanded belly starting. Okay. So I'm happy the, to yeah. comments. The um, membership uh, in the committee, uh, one of the things of the working group uh, anticipates that Vermont Retailers and Grocers Association, that is the reason that there are two, uh, two representatives of, sorry, I'm trying to find the right citation in here. Yes, there's two, two representatives two of food service establishments um, was so that <coughs> your organ yes. most likely your yes. organization might represent um, a wide group of people but we also thought about there could be um, other food services for instance um, Abbey group or Sedexo come to mind that might have a unique take are, are Abbey group or Sedexo part of the they are not okay. no right. um, are they part of a larger or a different organization they they might be part okay. of the Restaurant Association, oh, okay. um, but that's part that's of the yeah. State Chamber. Um, oh, and I apologize, I, I jumped right to my concerns, but I, we do appreciate your um, your significant uh, in-depth discussion yesterday, and um, I certainly don't envy you guys sitting at this table. So thank you for your, your efforts, um, and, and thank you for including a representative of the food industry in the I mean, personally, I don't even see the need of a study committee if you're just going to do the ban because there's no way, even if they come back and say it's bad, it's not going to get through the bills and do a ban next year. You're gonna, we're going to roll to the well, special looking interest at, on you, it. But you, the, I mean, the study committee is looking at a number of different things, okay. not just that. I mean, they're looking at the other six. It's a waste seven. of money now. No, because they're looking at seven other packaging. Was before. <laughs> no, really is. They're other, you know, to your point about solo cups versus Dunkin' Donut cups, it might, it might be that uh, we would, we would, the recommendation would be to include all forms of polystyrene or not, or it could be that actually. Which is the, why I think the, it's better to act on polystyrene after the study committee reports than before they report. We're already, we're already um, prejudicing their outcome by putting the putting the end result in place in my mind. Well, so again, you know, I, I appreciate that point of view. I would just encourage everyone to s spend some time mm -hmm. studying the additional information we got. If there are people with another point of view that argues against it, I'm going to count on them to um, offer testimony between now and a vote tomorrow, and we'll uh, see, where we, see where we land. Um, you know, trying to make sure that we're Fair to all parties, offering everyone the same sort of chance to participate in the development of the bill. The other thing is, um, you know, trying to be prudent about this in terms of giving a 16-month development period, so that if we learn more, we'll have the opportunity to make changes um, before any of this would become effective. Well, I, I guess I have some. Simply for Senator Paris, 
concern, we don't know in the grocery industry what is going to take the place of those styrofoam meat trays, which I hate styrofoam mm. anyway. But so, but if what takes its place is uh, another plastic. type of plastic that is heavier, it, it, and, uh, I mean, my, my big concern is the fact that the stuff breaks up so easy and can get away from you and floats and blows and all that in, the, in nature. Um, but what happens if what replaces it is just as bad in the meantime, it maybe it's heavier, time, yeah. it costs more, uh, and, and so. Putting some direction in there so that they don't create something that's worse would be interesting right around the process. Well, that's, you know, that the, the life cycle analysis stuff, adding transportation, I think that was really part of why we're trying to make sure that group looks at things, that they look at it from one end to the other and they're evaluating each thing relative to other alternatives so that we don't, you know, we started out, whatever, a month ago talking about would people be switching over to paper bags and then hearing about the greenhouse gas impacts of paper bags, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to avoid um, that. You know, um, okay, one other thing that's come up just so that people to help make sure that we don't lose track of it. We talked about that any kind of ban, uh, some people were saying, should include a fee so that people don't simply switch over to paper bags. And I think that's the kind of thing that could come out of a recommendation out of the working group rather than uh, what could be, uh, I don't know if people have given more thought to that one open question. We didn't come to a final position on it. And since we are editing, um, we could structure, you know, that we heard it, that fees were charged anywhere from a nickel to 25 cents in order to encourage people to think about using an alter, uh, a durable bag as opposed to a, a just switching to whatever was quote unquote free. So what would that, so what kind of position, I mean, what's, where's the legislature's role in this? In it? Because it's, I, I, and I'm just, right. you know, so if I had a grocery store and I wanted to now charge somebody right. for a paper bag, I could, right? Right. Well, Ms. Seegers can speak on behalf of grocers. My sense is that if, uh, yeah. yeah, some have given you yeah. credits for bringing your sure. bag, some are, which is sort of an implicit charge for not bringing your mm -hmm. bag. Um, others, I think, are actually charging for bags. And um, in order to get, I think, my sense is, so correct me if I'm wrong, is that in a way we're doing the retailers and grocers a favor mm -hmm. by making it the same policy for all so that um, we're encouraging the use of durable bags as opposed to having so them sorted out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, again, for the record, Aaron Segrist from Aunt Retailing Grocers. Our, um, the, the large grocers um, have concern that if we simply ban plastic, um, let me step back. This world is all about convenience, right? So if you provide, not all about it, but it's very much um, a, a large part of this world. We, we like convenience. Um, so if you walk into a grocery store and you are provided two options, paper or plastic, and, and we eliminate one of those options, they're still expecting that, that other option. So you're not going to simply say, ban plastic, you need to bring your, your recyclable or your reusable bags, and people will instantly bring them. They're going to take that other option. So if you're going to ban paper or ban plastic, you need to charge some type of fee to discourage people from taking the other quote free yeah. alternative. Yeah. If um, uh, so, it's it's always it's been for quite some time anyway the position that if you're going to charge one, you need to charge for the other. Mm -hmm. If you're so, it's either going to be a fee on both or a ban on one and a fee on the other. So Hanford's, I heard in Brattleboro, um, you know, when they did the, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it's been. So Hannaford's, I know they've gotten rid of the plastic. Do you know if they put a fee on the paper? I cannot speak to Hannaford, okay. but I have or received communication um, from Price Chopper. Okay. And there is a fee on paper. Do you know what they put on? 
It's in the it's in my email. I want to say ten cents, but okay. I I don't don't quote me. I have it in my email. I can I'm just share curious. It with you. And that uh, goes to them, right? They yes. keep that fee yes. for the for all that thing. Okay. And, and how does your organization feel as opposed to this legislation if we were to put a fee on both? So uh, the bill that we uh, in my my previous testimony, the bill that we are supporting this year, it's H. 506 or 509. It's a bill put out by uh, Representative Butch Shaw. Um, it would impose a five cent fee on paper and plastic starting in September 2019. And then one year after, it would ban plastic and continue the five cent fee on paper. But it's five cents the enough. That's, that would be my concern. Is five cents enough? I'm happy to have a conversation about other options, but I felt that that was the, we, I'm, I'm okay with that being the starting point. Okay. It, 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 you know, when, when we're talking about this thing, we're, supposed, we're trying to do right in this one tiny uh, little section, but you know, I, I mentioned to somebody yesterday, uh, I mean, this is about climate change. It's also tied to, to the waste stream and the recycling stream, but, um, we're not talking about K cups, and I, you know, nothing uh, bad. Are the, yeah, the little yeah, individual uh, packets. They yeah. are one of Ugh. the most Adam absurd the <laughs> right. things possible in the waste stream. And yeah. there's there's figures out there about how many of them are piling up in the landfill every year. And then I'm going to take it a step further. Everybody here that's concerned about climate change that gets on a uh, commercial airline once or twice a year is not walking the walk. It's one of the biggest polluters on earth. It's the most inefficient way to travel. And so we I may have heard we, you speaking about this last evening, actually. Were you giving a speech on this, actually? I was. Because uh, I was, I did actually oh. hear it. I did hear it. And, and you I'm know, being serious. And so he was actually we're, talking about we're nibbling, We're nibbling around the edges here. Yeah. But there's a whole bunch of people that are that are pushing for these little nibbles. They're still going on several vacations a year to distant places on the conferences jets. Of well, yeah, it's like Bill McKibben's flying all around I the think world. You, I think part of your speech last night may have been I'm directed like, at <laughs> even um, though I didn't go anywhere. But it's, it's like there, because <laughs> there are alternative <laughs> methods you could do it. Roger. You could do it by computer, but tons of people still aren't. So they're goes they're, back to the they're, convenience. They're thing. talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And thank you for the comment. Get the um, paid. I, I don't think I'm, I wasn't going to go that far, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that is that's the conversation that I I and others in this building have been having for for several years. We are picking and choosing what we want to what we want to target. Because it's quote sexy, yeah. but you know we've I've spoken about film plastic. You know, um, if a grocery store gets um, a large pallet of food, that pallet is wrapped with plastic mm -hmm. that gets stuck in in the murks. It, it gets it gets um, thrown out in in the landfills. You know, we the industry has tried its best to figure out how to collect all of that and move it to a recycling, another recycling location. What do we do with it? But there's been no discussion. Every time the, that group comes to the table, there's no serious discussion about how to help the industries fix it. Like, mm -hmm. The industries, industries are really trying to mm -hmm. fix the issue, but they need help. You know, there are, there are large manufacturers around this country that are doing everything they possibly can to fix the issue, but they're getting the fingers pointed at them saying, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. They're trying to fix it. Like and farmers. also, I'm just, uh, and then I'll get off my soapbox. Consumers are, are screaming about this stuff. So we all know that if consumers are screaming about it, the manufacturers are gonna do everything they possibly can mm -hmm. to, to try and fix it. They're doing the best they can. So picking off, picking and choosing what's quote sexy right. is, is a little frustrating for the small businesses that are trying to manage their business in the state. 
My only disagreement with you on this is that I've seen nothing sexy about plastic bags. <laughs> <laughs> it's sexy because you it's get to popular, say it's sexy. Right, right. Like, it, it's sexy with our constituents. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, popular, but, I'd say. Yeah. You know, so I think, and to that point, I think that's, that is really the point of the working group. Yes. Yeah. And look yeah. at, you know, the whole, uh, although I, I think other people with concerns around extended producer okay. responsibility, that's just one model. But the whole notion is that you have people thinking about something from creation to final disposition so that we stop sort of, uh, it, it's like a game of hot potatoes. It just keeps, someone else gets the problem and we wanna uh, try to stop creating the problems that others get stuck with uh, just from the get-go. Senator McDonald. So when, you, when we break for lunch or whenever I ask those in the room to Google the graduate, Oh, oh and plastics. plastics and watch the clip because that was when the time, you know, that was 51 years ago. Right. This week was, was a release. So, yeah. you know, hey, only 51 years. Yeah. <coughs> okay. But anyway, Thank you so you'll like, yeah. enjoy the, yeah, no, it's, it's a great. short clip. Just so I'm not really Remember putting that? words in your mouth that you don't, that, uh, unintentionally, yeah. the, the 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 fee related to uh, a, the alternate bag, whatever it is, um, is something that you feel would be helpful to members of your organization in order to avoid just switching to that, and then it becomes a new cost. I, I think if um, if you go to a, a grocery store and you are provided two options and you take one of those options away there is still an expectation for that free option. So it does not change consumer practice. So there needs to be some type of, of fee right. or some type of something to discourage right. them from an expectation. Right. Right. Otherwise, okay, we end up pushing costs onto retailers. You end up pushing costs onto the retailer, but there's but there's also the discussion about is, is paper right. any better than plastic? Yes, you know? for sure. And you're not changing consumer. If, if the goal is to change consumer practice, then you need to do it by discouraging them from it, expecting something free. Do you happen to know if, um, so I, I, there's a Hannaford's near me that I've been mm -hmm. in many times. Uh, they, they sell Hannaford durable plastic bags. Yes. Do you know if those are basically sort of a break even item for them or they actually make money selling them? I'm just curious. I have spoken to Hannaford. I have not spoken to the other two large grocery stores, and I believe that that is simply a break even. Uh -huh. Yes. So they're trying to make it as easy as possible to get a durable bag, yes. or as cheap as possible. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Right. So, um, with that, I, I you know with, there's some editing to do to create the next draft. I'll work with Mr. Grady on that. Um, It'll include the changes we discussed, plus um, I, I would say here's this was the last item we just talked about, which was adding a fee. And so if, um, let me pause and straw poll, or edify straw poll, who is in favor of including that fee in the underlying, in the, in the bill that we passed? Yeah, out? I mean, if that's helpful to the grocers, absolutely. All right, yeah. so, yeah. Uh, Sir McDonald? A yes or no? Yeah. Yes. 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 Senator yeah, that Perrin? Well, that nope. Okay, Senator Rogers. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in favor of a fee. Um, yeah, I'm still mildly interested in a, in a, in a fee on both. Just a, What's the both? Well, <laughs> both plastic and paper. I know that's not the direction of the rest of the committees headed at this right. point, but, you know, back to... Well, plastics would be banned. So I, yeah, I, right. I, I, yeah, no, I, I understand that. And I'm just rethinking that, I don't know, I, I, I'll have to give it some more thought, but yes, I think there, sh I think there should be a fee on whatever bag option yeah. is left. Okay. okay, all right, so we'll have another draft that reflects those consensus positions and um, to vote tomorrow. If anyone has feedback or information they want the committee to evaluate, I'd ask you to reach out to me and to uh, copy uh, June 
uh, ASAP so that we'll have that information to evaluate. And I would also ask people to use some of the extra 42 minutes we'll have today by adjourning early to um, look this material over that came from Mr. Burns. Okay, if there's no more, I see no more hands. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you everybody for working at double time.